Good afternoon, it's John Heaton and uh, today I have the pleasure of being joined by my friend Tim Popple, who's going to review a David Bowie album um, with me. So if you remember uh, a couple of years ago I did a review with our mutual friend Andrew Crook where we reviewed Low together at Andrew's house in, uh, in Essex and today we're in Budapest and we're going to cover Diamond Dogs. So just before we start I'm going to show you my vinyl copies. This is the original copy I had, which was actually had the airbrushed out genitalia here, so this was the censored version. Uh, you were saying that the original version with the genitalia is worth how much? A few thousand, apparently. Yeah, well, it's only a few of them ever done. That's incredible. Um, but I'm happy to say when they released the new vinyl, this is my son's copy, um, they, they restored the genitalia there. So it's a really impressive painting by... Uh, Guy Peel Peelet, um, and the inside photograph, although it doesn't look like a photograph to me, it looks more like a painting, but apparently it's a photograph. It's by Lee Black Childers. Do you know where that photo was taken? No, no idea. Future legend. It looks like a cross between the, the old and the new here. I can't quite work out if it's a modern city or a, an mm. ancient shipping. Like Shanghai or something. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And then... Just today, I was happy to find this copy, which is a 45th anniversary. On, I'm a bit of a sucker for red vinyl, for coloured vinyl, and it was reasonably priced. You know, a lot of coloured vinyl these days they charge uh, 40 quid for, but this was, um, you know, less than 20 quid, which I think is pretty good value for coloured vinyl. Um, so I, I couldn't resist that, and especially as we're doing this review today. So before we get into the nitty gritty, do you want to just introduce how you got into Bowie and how this album featured in that? Yeah, well, I, uh, I grew up with two older brothers. I'm 55, and my two older brothers were old enough to be well into Bowie, especially my eldest, who's seven years older than me. And I think he did see him in his Ziggy Stardust days, live at Hammersmith or wherever. Um, and uh, albeit I listened to uh, Hunky Dory, Ziggy, and... Aladdin sort of second hand, it was Diamond Dogs that I started listening to on my own when I was about 11 or 12 um, because we had this ridiculous spaceship looking 8 track uh, radio and disc player which I would have loved to have brought but it's great big, it looks like a space helmet. Do you still and, have the 8 track? Yeah, we've still got it. I haven't got the 8 track David Burry you sadly. Have? No, well, it just <laughs> got, they got the machine though, it's probably worth a fortune. Yep. Um, and I used to stick this 8 track on and listen to it over and over again while I was helping my mum make uh, fairy cakes as you do as an 11 year old kid and uh, this is probably the first album that I listened to over and over again extensively normally asking my mum what the hell does that mean <laughs> which I actually still do when I listen yeah. to this album did you know that it was based on Orwell's book at the time or you found yeah that later? no I knew it was Orwell I knew it was based 1984 was an iconic book in him as a 10 11 year old so I knew right. that and uh, Future Legend I think it was pretty clear that it was some um, sort of uh, yeah. ap ap apocalyptic yes. city, post-apocalyptic city. So yeah, I am pretty much knew what it was about. Yeah. And um, what does an 8-track sound like? Is it similar to a cassette? Yeah, it's probably? pretty, well, I was young, but it sounded pretty good. It's just it's a lot of mucking around with it, that's the problem. I yeah. wonder it didn't succeed. I mean, it doesn't skip like vinyl, so no. that's good. Uh, this is the cover, picture from the CD here. I'm not sure who... I won't look up who did that, but that, that was an interesting alternative shot there. Um, a couple of bonus tracks on here. So the album was released on the 24th of May 1974. It was recorded at Olympic Studios and Island Studios in, in London, and also a studio in Holland where the Rolling Stones were also recording It's Only Rock and Roll, the album, at the same time. And one can hear the Stones' influence, particularly on the title track, I think, the chugging title track, which is... Seem, and Je, um, Do, Bowie seems to be singing a bit Jagger-esque in Rebel Rebel, I noticed, so that was interesting. The album reached number one in the UK, number five in the US, and it's interesting to note the musicians because the Spiders from Mars had been let go, although we think, we think Mick Ronson was involved in yeah. the early sessions. Apparently he did the arranging... The uh, the guitar, well probably all the arrangements you know, be Bronson but certainly did the guitar arrangements prior but I think Barry did the lead um, yeah. during the actual recordings. 
It's funny how Ronson doesn't get a credit on the album, not even on the reissue. So it's, it's credited as being produced by David Bowie and all the guitars are credited to Bowie. So it was quite brave of him to take on that, that uh, piece which had been so well looked after by Mick Ronson. And Mike Garson is on keyboards, had also played on Aladdin Sane on the title track in time to good effect. Uh, Ainsley Dunbar shares the, ju the drums with Tony Newman and then we've got the venerable uh, Herbie Flowers on bass who'd also played with um, Nielsen um, who was later in T-Rex and he played on Lou Reed's Transformer album uh, from a couple of years before this and then later with George Harrison as well so completely different band and um, yeah so let's, uh, let's, let's go through the track so the f future legend, I'm not quite sure what this, I mean, I know it's supposed to be a, 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 a apocalyptic, but um, I don't know what he means by the scent rock and roll, this is genocide. You know, any, any ideas? Well, no, I've never, to be honest, that was one, not one of the more iconic statements, but yeah. again, I think with this album and with those first two tracks, um, it, to me, it's one of the first concept albums out there. It's, uh, and it's very difficult to listen to Diamond Dogs without listening to Future Legends, Legend and vice versa. Yeah. To me, they, they fit in perfectly and they, they bleed from one to another. And it's why shuffling songs on Spotify doesn't work. Um, I'll say that for the two, whole album in general. Yeah, you? yeah. absolutely. There's a, it, it's, it's an album that works in clusters, but it works as an entity yeah. as a whole, but you can listen to it in clusters, but you can't listen to a lot of these tracks independently. And I think Future Legends is definitely one of them. You've got to listen yeah. to it with Diamond Dogs. I agree. Do you remember how in the UK, when you bought a cassette, sometimes they did a criminal thing and mucked around with the track order to get the two sides to be equal length? Yeah. Remember that? Well, they, yeah. they did that. I had this on cassette first. And so it started off with Future Legend, Diamond Dogs, and then Rock and Roll With Me was next. Yeah, that's So for years and years, I thought that was the second track, and then here it is, opening side two on the vinyl. So anyway, that's yeah. just a fact. I, I had to grow up, grow up with that, unfortunately. Um, so yeah, then we move into Sweet Thing and Candidate, which should have followed, which do follow the, the opening two tracks, unlike on the cassette. And um, you're a big fan of this, this medley, right? Uh, yeah, the, I would say that's probably, well, it's a medley, but to me, don't, don't forget, I, I didn't actually look at the tracks on the cassette, so for yeah. years I actually thought it was one song. Yeah. So when, uh, as you, you showed the CD, which yeah. I bought years later, when it says Candidate, Reprisal, I'm like, what's that then? Because <laughs> you thought it was just one, yeah. great big long track. <laughs> one great big long track. Yeah. Um, so I think that's, I think that's my favourite song. Um, yeah. Or favourite medley. Sweet Things, I think it just works beautifully. Yeah. Going from Sweet Thing into uh, Candidate and then back into Sweet Thing, which has got that uh, pretty immense closure of a song. Yeah. And then, I don't know how you worked it on a cassette, it then goes into Rebel Rebel. It's a brilliant link then into Rebel yeah. Rebel. So I think that song, that medley is fantastic. Yeah, I love the tempo changes as well. Yeah. And Bowie's also playing sax on this, uh, on this album. And he, he's not the most accomplished player, but he, he's, it's quite, it's quite uh, good to hear that. And then Rebel Rebel, as Tim said, a great intro into that. And a classic riff, you know, this latest, and maybe one of the last rockers in the same sort of uh, period as Suffragette City and um, Watch That Man and Gene Genie and I think it's for me one of the more one of the most successful particularly the riff which is maybe Ronson came up with the riff but Bowie does a good job nailing it um, I always used to play this track at parties when I was younger but maybe it's a case of one is a bit over familiar with it so that's the case with you I think is it? Yeah I think it's a great start great riff I think that as an album as a whole it's all about the lyrics in this album and I think I just it's just not my favourite song. I love the riff, I love the start, and then I just I just think it's a bit boring personally, the song. Oh, I hate right. to tell you this joke. Okay, all right. <laughs> this it's my favourite Bowie album. Yep. And my least favourite Bowie song on that album. But not of all time. But no, 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 it's still Bowie. It's still, still superior to ninety nine percent of songs known to mankind. That's it. That's the point of view. Okay, just we got that straight. Um <laughs> So we move to side two, and this is a really nice piano ballad. I love the way that, I'm not sure if it's Bowie or Mike Garson playing the piano at the beginning there, presumably Mike Garson. Um, but I, I find this song quite moving. Uh, the ultimate music guide here 
I keep on referring to this series, this superb series, where and the essay for Darwin Dogs is written by Graham Thompson. And um, one of the reviews at the time from Chris Charlesworth in The Melody Maker, excellent, he's adapted a wall of sound technique borrowed not a little from Phil Spector, but the richness enhances his voice no end. Whereas Ian MacDonald, the famous guy who wrote the book on the Beatles and was negative about several tracks uh, famously, and he's negative here again. I guess it will turn out to be a success. As for your reviewer, he was left steeped in impotent caution, conscious that he hadn't really been moved by it at all. Well, Ian MacDonald, you're wrong again, as usual. But, um, not as usual, but as you have been before. It's a matter of opinion, of course. Um, so yeah, worth checking out the essay here. They didn't much like when you rock and roll with me, and I don't think it's your favourite, Tim, is it either? It's not my favourite, yeah. It's a good, it's a good song, but it's not stunning. Good yeah. song. Which brings us to We Are the Dead, and this is where he gets pretty ambitious with the arrangements. Um, uh, and you think that was maybe helped Mick Ronson help with the you're talking about the strings? Generally, but I'm not sure. Yeah, but I know T Tony Visconti was back on board for mm. this album, so he, and I think he probably was involved in. Uh, Actually, the strings on 1984, arranged by Tony Visconti. Visconti. Guitar on 1984, Alan Parker, who recently passed away, didn't he? What, the film um, director? Well, it's not the same guy. I don't know if it was. The <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know him into his guitars. <laughs> <laughs> All right, apologies if it's not the same guy. So then, but We Are The Dead, you, you're a fan of this one? Oh, I love this great. song. Yeah. I just think the lyrics, again, are amazing. Um, I think it's probably the least recognised song on the album. I don't know what that reviewer said on it, but um, I, I just loved it. I loved the lyrics again. I love the way he goes. Again, it's all about the lyrics in this album and how he mixes things up and changes tempo, etc., and uses different instruments. And so in this one, the, the, instruments, uh, the uh, lyrics really stick out. Yeah, this is one of the tracks which you can imagine being part of that or Orwellian musical that he was planning to do. Yeah. Um, but he, apparently he approached the family, George Orwell's family, and they, they refused him. So yeah. this ended up being a kind of semi-semi concept album on here. Um, 1984 is even more blatantly a reference to, to the book. And um, it's another storming track with a great arrangement. Yeah, and I think it's a sign of where he was going as well in 1984. The start of his movement to his more solely jazz sort of period and I thought that was the sort of track that was sort of introducing that personally but I oh, love right. that track I think it's a really when I, funny enough when I was a kid that was my least favourite track and now when I'm listening to it now I think it's really good really solid and um, good track yeah I remember not particularly liking it when I was younger but it's one of those, those tracks which grows in you I think but Big Brother the next track has always been my favourite on here um, with the possible exception of Rebel Rebel when I was younger but uh I was listening to it this morning, and that whoever does that keyboard solo in the middle, I guess it's Mike Carson. That's that's a standout, and the chorus is one of those ones where you just have to join in, shouting at the top of your voice. It's got a brilliant someone finish. to lean on, someone brilliant to follow. Finish. Just yeah. Oh, the way it goes into the, the yeah, chant. but the, it goes to that. I can't remember the lyrics now, but it goes. He, he really changes the tempo, etc. Oh, you and then get just yeah. the acoustic at the end. Someone to it, and bang. Yeah, brilliant. brilliant. Yep, yep. And then, and then bang into that chant. Which is quite an unsettling ending to the album. But yeah, yeah I mean, very uplifting. Oh, brilliant. I think those two tracks, again, they go together. You can't, I can't really separate the two. And uh, I think it's a fantastic finish. I, I would say the reason I love this album so much is there's a lot on it. He keeps on changing the tempo. He finishes songs imaginatively. Um, he's got all sort of little gadgets and tricks, lots of instrumentation, different instrumentation coming through. My only criticism of it, and it's always been my criticism of this album, is it's too short. I just, I've always been stunned why, he, you know, it was such a short album. I was, 30 I, minutes, just, 25. I just felt there was... Standard length. Really? I always yeah. felt there's, he could have, you know, I just felt that it was such a good album, I thought, gosh, it was a bit longer. I don't know why. Well, I'm thankful it's not one of these 57-minute albums oh, no, which, uh, which bands put out today and, and make it into a double all the mm. time. Um, so you followed his career after this for a while, and what, just in a few sentences, what did you think, how he did after this album? Well, to me, this was the high. We've always had this debate, John. Right. I'm, I'm, you know what I think? I, don't, I think between Hunky Dory and Diamond Dogs, he's never got near that, personally. Um, I've been a fan of his all the way up to 
um, probably most Bowie fans, which would be the mid eighties, and then sort of lost touch a little bit with him. But I don't think he ever hit those heights. And he went to music to music that I'm I'm not I wasn't a huge fan of anyway. His musical style. Now that's not to say he didn't do some amazing records. You know, Heroes and um, I love uh, Lodger. I thought it was a great album. I love a lot of this new stuff, new stuff, the early eighties stuff. Yeah. Scary Monsters and all that, but I, uh, Hunky Dory, Diamond Dogs, those two albums are my, by far my two outstanding Bowie albums and always will be. Jolly good. Well, I, I believe I did put this in my top 12, so I've escaped the wrath of Tim Pobble. If I hadn't done that, it would have been <laughs> terrible. But, uh, but everything about it, the cover, no, the I'm... album, the, just minor things, the way he finishes Diamond Dogs and the, you know, the way it ends that record and then into Sweet Thing. And it's just, I just think it's fantastic. It's a fabulous album all the way through from start to end. And I do think it's an improvement on the Aladdin Sane, you agree? Yeah, I, I, yeah. I like Aladdin Sane, big fan of Aladdin Sane, but there's some real dodgy tracks on Aladdin Sane. Okay, we'll, we'll, <laughs> well, we'll save that for another day. We don't want to upset too many of our <laughs> viewers out there. So, as always, it's only our opinion not to be taken too seriously. So, I hope you enjoyed the video and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching. Cheers. Bye bye.